feel um, reenactment is a way to explore um, our relationship with the past mm -hmm. and how we represent it. Mm -hmm. Can you expand this concept? Can you develop this concept? This uh, yeah, certainly. Um, I see all kinds of reenactment. So reenactment from uh, formal reenactment, like um, reenactment of battles and uh, historical events, such as you're talking about, to uh, museum reenactment. So um, that kind of uh, education uh, reenactment as being a, on a continuum. And that continuum is about uh, a pat particular way of comprehending the past. And that way of comprehending the past is, is in re-performing it. Um, and I, I find that incredibly fascinating because evidently you can't recreate the past. Um, so what anyone who participates in reenactment or anyone who watches reenactment is doing is something quite intellectually strange. Uh, they are watching someone play a part and therefore their, their conception of how they relate to history, their conception of how history might be presented is very peculiar. Yeah, and what reenactment does for me and for quite a lot of scholars on, who work on reenactment is demonstrate the kind of uh, problematic aesthetic, um, intellectual, ethical issues associated with Re uh, representing the past in the in in the contemporary moment, and they show this kind of gap that oftentimes what we might call mainstream history doesn't. Mainstream history is oftentimes interested in being intending toward a kind of truth, not to say that it sees itself as truth or objective as true or objective, but all mainstream historical work, scholarship, professional history would be interested in is, is suggesting a kind of set of ways of investigating the past which might give us an understanding of that past. Whereas what scholars of, of reenactment are interested in are seeing how actually the ways that we investigate the past, the ways in which we re represent the past. Um, you have said it. In reenactment, the relationship with the past is performed, mm -hmm. is dramatized. Mm -hmm. uh, how do theatre and reenactment are similar or different? Um, well, firstly, they're very similar. Reenactment is a performance, mostly, with an audience, mostly. Um, so therefore, it satisfies certain ge generic proper uh, guidelines. So it is, it is, to my mind, it's, it's, it's performance, maybe not theatre necessarily. Um, so they're very similar. And so therefore, the experience of the audience is similar. Yet what, what we don't take much notice of oftentimes when we think about reenactment is the audience. Um, and what they're doing and what their work is. Um, so they are very similar. At the same time, they're incredibly different because of the uh, what you might call the kind of directionality of reenactment or the authentic um, drive of reenactment. Reenactors, if you speak to them, are incredibly concerned with authenticity. So where theatre is about quite happily about reimagining and rethinking even verbatim theatre, even theatre which is based on true, true events. Um, but it's still a kind of um, uh, fictive game. Reenactment always has this drive toward a, some kind of authentic experience. And that's fascinating because there's this sense in which if you just wear the right costume and do the right thing and speak the right language, you might somehow gain an insight which is different to that insight that other people might gain. Um, a great example are the um, North American reenactors, the Civil War reenactors that um, Tony Horowitz writes about in Confederates in the Attic. Um, and he talks about this one man who is so committed that, for instance, before a reenactment, he will sleep rough. Um, he, tr he wants to catch diseases so that he is kind of properly early, uh, properly mid 19th century. He has this kind of drive toward authenticity because somehow that's going to make him more real in the now, maybe. Somehow it's going to enable him to say something more profound about what it was to be alive then. So performance, they're both performance. Theatre is performance which knows it's going to end, whereas reenactment has this authenticity which means that it's never going to end. You're always going to have to try and make it slightly better or more authentic. But you have a an aim in sight, which is which is some kind of revelation, some kind of comprehension 
of a different state, um, which is quite astounding as a, as a thing to want to do. So it's important, the historical accuracy. To the reenactors, most very, very often it is, yeah. Uh, there are, in, within reenactment circles, there tend to be kind of two levels. There are people who are uh, hobbyists, uh, just doing it for the, collect the community experience oftentimes. Um, and then there are people who are incredibly committed. Um, and people will spend a large amount of money, a lot of time doing this. Um, there's a fabulous book by a librarian, uh, sorry, not a librarian, someone who used to work at the Smithsonian, and she started to investigate this. And she revealed an amazing kind of set of worlds of reenactments, uh, which is, which are, like any subculture, have all these kinds of rules. But um, one of the m most amazing things she, re she, she demonstrated was that there is public reenactment and there is private reenactment, if you're a reenactor. Public reenactment, you go to a location, you p perform a particular uh, event, generally combat, um, and you satisfy certain historical rules, i.e. the same people win the conflict, whatever it is. Then there's kind of what you might call improvised reenactment, yeah? Where people dress up and they perform historically, but they do it in private or no one to be, to be able to watch. Um, and so therefore the kind of timeline doesn't exist. So what might occur is what might have occurred in 1860. <laughs> so there's this kind of really very strange sense in which they might, they're rewriting historicalness in some ways because they are performing to a sort of, to such a level of authenticity that what they do is somehow historical, <laughs> if that makes sense, right? And I love this because it completely transforms our idea of what history is, what, how our, our experience of the past works, um, how time works, uh, and it's incredibly a, uh, outside of the academy as well. So it's kind of got this radical sense in some ways, you know, that you know, reenactors are, are always slightly on the edge of mainstream discourse because they're, you know, uh, slightly overcommitted oftentimes, and that's, that's the kind of cliche of them in the UK anyway. Uh, do you think that through reenactment uh, the dichotomy between popular history and academic history can be overcome? That's a very good question. In the UK, reenactment, um, the largest reenactment society in the UK is the Sealed Knot, which was established by academics. Um, and it was established by uh, social historians who were interested in uh, investigating day-to-dayness. They were interested in what happened on a, on a daily basis during the war in the 1640s. Um, and they were interested in using um, historically informed techniques to, un to comprehend that. So costume, action, uh, they would grow beards, they would grow their hair, Etc. Etc. So there is, in many ways, uh, a kind of very clear relationship between the academy and um, uh, and reenactment, but that's quite small. <laughs> Subsequently, I would say that reenactment has become uh, something that that scholars don't really get because it's done in an amateur way. And that's great because it means that it's, from my, my point of view, because it, it means that it's done uh, without scholarly kind of interference. Um, I think the problem is, in your question, that I'm not sure that reenactment is popular history. I think it might be something on its own, if you see what I mean. However, where this becomes quite interesting is in documentary. So a lot of historical documentary uses reenactment as kind of visual background. Um, so a, 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 a documentary on the um, 1750s will have people dressed and they will have some shots of people in uh, rooms playing cards or whatever. So there's a kind of very, very low level reenactment in nearly every historical kind of production. And you might argue that even historical film is at a certain level reenactment. Um, 
certainly there are uh, cases where Hollywood movies have used reenactment societies for. Um, so there's a kind of very fun. Anyway, to get back to the question, um, I think reenactment is a very good example of how popular history and academic history don't really understand one another um, because they offer different things. Um, and what is really interesting in the last five years is that academic history is, or academics in general have started to be more interested in reenactment because they've got the fact that they don't understand it. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Um, in your work, you say reenactment allows the controlled entry of the past into the contemporary moment. Oh, no, what was um, in your work, mm -hmm. in, in maybe in the book, uh, Intention is history. history mm -hmm. you, you have said reenactment allows the controlled entry of the past into the contemporary mm -hmm. moment. How does this activity can influence social identity and memory? Well, in terms of the controlled entry, reenactment on the one hand is uncontrolled because it hasn't got a disciplinary discourse going on, um, really. On the other, it's very, very controlled because it follows certain rules. You, you have to wear certain things. So, I think... What it, what it means for me in terms of identity is that once you're performing anything, I think as the reenactor, you enter into a very strange place. Um, and that has to have some form of transformative possibility um, because you're, whether it's real or not, you are opening up the possibility of a different kind of communication with a different type of knowledge which is the knowledge of the past, yeah? So that's the, that's the reenactor. So there's the, I don't know that it ever happens, but there is the distinct possibility of a transformative effect in the same way that any performance has the distinct possibility of that. But to go back to your question about history, about reenactment of theatre, theatre is always controlled because we don't expect the performer of Beckett to have a nervous breakdown and, and leave the theatre, or the performer of Hamlet to suddenly discover that, you know, they, 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 there's not an affinity of them with the character. They're a professional doing the job. Whereas the reenactment, because they're amateur, there's much more of a sense in which this might be possible, this might have a possibility of, of transform transformation. This might open up a space where something new actually might be created. Um, so there's that. For the, for, sorry, for the viewer, much as performance theory is interested in how performance challenges roles and challenges identities uh, for a viewer as much as for a performer. Reenactment can do that. It can, it can demonstrate how historical identities are not fixed and so therefore we can challenge historical identities. Uh, it can demonstrate how historical identities might be performed in the same way that we might argue that gender identity is performed or that sexual identity might be performed. It, it, it allows the kind of disjunction between something which is innate or seen to be innate and something which is performed to be seen and so therefore it's got quite a radical potential for an audience I think but in the same way that any performance has a radical potential for an audience but because this because of what I said before because this is related to history and fact and authenticity and reality it's slightly different you don't go to the theatre expecting to learn something about your national identity. You might go and watch reenactment to, to, to try and learn something about the past or how we know the past or things that happened. And if you then add that kind of transformative element to that, it becomes much more interesting. Uh, not much more, it becomes very interesting. <laughs> well, we have thought in this question because we have seen that um, reenactment is becoming like a, a tradition. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and helps to have a self-conscious of mm -hmm. the community. And it's, it's something strange because it's, it's brand new. So well, the, the reenactment where... Well, I mean, there's two things to that. One is that, so, uh, Jeremy Della, who I mentioned earlier, he, his reenactment of the miners' strike, the Battle of All Grieve during the miners' strike in, the, in 1984, um, was intended as a community experience 
and those that were part of the community that was attacked and destroyed by that by that action to a certain extent um, are participate and so it's kind of about healing it's kind of about understanding and coming to terms with things so it has a very deep important um, uh, impact um, so there's that but also so there's a there's a kind of tradition of community reenactment as you say and if you go to, to towns and villages in the UK there are community reenactment that's been going on for years and years and years and years if you go to York for instance they do the mystery plays in York and they've been doing them for centuries so there's this kind of traditional sort of thing the other hand you've got people like Bruce Nauman um, and various other artists who are very interested in reenactment as reworking, replaying, reordering, as something quite radical, as something quite new. Um, so you've got these kind of two things going on. You've got a very, very kind of traditional sense of reenactment as um, something genealogical, even something about r heritage and recollection and memory, and that's kind of stable and good. And then you've got this idea that reenactment can be really radical and actually can really transform and change and challenge. Um, the student who just came in, this is interesting, he's working on uh, the uh, Argentinian writer um, uh, Borges, um, and he's writing, if, I don't know if you know Borges, but he's, uh, he, has an, uh, he has a story called, um, about a guy called Pierre Menard, uh, who, who rewrites the Don Quixote. Um, and he does this, he, obviously, I mean, I don't know, yeah, I love this story, but, and I don't know how, you presumably you know. Cause, um, but that idea of redoing something again, uh, not translating it, but somehow reliving it again, or somehow, and it being more radical in the early 20th century than it is in, 16, uh, in the 1590s, um, is incredibly interesting uh, as an aesthetic move. And it's something that um, James Joyce also does in um, Ulysses. He kind of just rehearses all these different styles in Ulysses uh, as a way of trying to create a new artistic language. And it seems to me that the reason that these um, artists are so interested in reenactment currently, um, what's her name? There's a very great artist who I've seen quite recently in Liverpool um, who, who reenacts quite a lot of famous um, performance art. Um, one of the reasons they're so interested in it is because they're actually redoing something, not as a pastiche, not as a parody, but as a kind of austere uh, action, as somehow it, being, it coming from you whether you, you know, we're, that's amazing <laughs> uh, and, and strange. And what it says about creation is really interesting. What it says about identity and history is quite interesting. So if we go back to those reenactors who go into the forest and do their own thing. They're kind of doing that. They're recreating history. They're being historical in the now. And that's incredibly strange and incredibly radical. And the fact that, you know, it's sort of something which is laughed at, I find it insane because, you know, I think this is just intellectually such a complex thing to be to be to be doing and radically aesthetically interesting uh, related with you know with the entry of the past into the contemporary moment which elements of the present are put in the past in reenactment for example it's um, in our reenactment women dress as men mm -hmm. soldiers uh, but in historical battle that yeah uh, would be impossible well, there's two, for most public reenactment, there's, there's at least three things that are put in present in the past. So quite a lot of, most reenactment, con most contemporary reenactment, in terms of actual people reenacting in front of other people, happens in heritage sites and museums. And that therefore has a purpose, and that purpose is um, educative. So therefore, you've got, immediately, the relationship is about education. So that's one of the things I think, you know, what, it's not, so the past has been, um, turned into a set of things you might learn from or you might learn about. Um, so that's, I would say, one, one instant issue. Um, the, 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 as you say, in terms of your example, the thing that makes a difference is the body of the contemporary person. Um, so on the one hand, what they're looking for is a bodily experience of the past, but similarly, the past is being contemporized by their body, if that makes sense. Yeah? And so all kinds of things like uh, different genders, different races, different classes, make the performance of the past completely different to what it would be, even though it's striving for this authenticity. This is why the kind of North American guys who are so completely wanting to be radically authentic are trying to take, they're trying to get diseases, but not, they don't want to get contemporary diseases, they want 19th century diseases. <laughs> they want to gay, you know, they, they want measles, they want yellow fever, they don't, they don't want to get, you know, kind of, um, 
I don't know what contemporary disease would be, but <laughs> that, do you see what I mean? They're not interested in that. Um, the third thing that gets brought into the past from the present is, um, and this is very interesting, is, uh, well, authenticity, real authenticity. You go and watch a battle, no one actually gets killed. You go and watch German soldiers fighting British soldiers in a, a reenactment of, a, of the, of the uh, D-Day landings. No one is killed. No one is actually a fascist. No one is actually going to be, you know, um, taken, taken prisoner. There's that kind of, that edge of extremity is not there. But so, but on the one hand, you don't have the violence, although there's a kind of playing at the violence. And that's what I find fascinating about reenactment. All, nearly 90% of reenactment is about violence. Right? Why do we care so much about wars and battles? Oh, uh, these are the things that are kind of re recollected in memorial uh, way. But also, we don't reenact very often experiments, uh, great leaps forward in science, uh, great uh, civic or, or social uh, developments, uh, governments, uh, the establishment of the NHS. These are not things that are generally reenacted, although the Olympics two years ago did that. Um, so you don't have that edge, but, but also the reason we don't have that edge is because we wouldn't allow that edge to happen because we are watching this thing as a controlled thing. So we're kind of controlling history. We want to know that this happened and we want to understand how it happened. And we want to get a kind of closer sense to it because people are actually doing it in front of us. But we don't actually want to see someone have their head cut off or someone bleeding or someone acting as a fascist, or someone speaking German to us. You know, they're all, they're, and they're, there's a kind of continuum of authenticity which we do not want to get involved with, um, which is fascinating to me because it's again, it's about I really want this, but I don't actually want it. Uh, a good example is the um, the German reenactors who, who, if you reenact, uh, there are s several um, companies who reenact uh, Second World War German. Uh, uh, outfits, they're, they're very, very authentic, they've got, got a very clear kind of uh, hierarchy, uh, they're mapped onto a very clear set of um, originals, as it were, but there are certain things they can't do. They can't um, do certain actions, they can't um, in any way speak, uh, in, any, in any way that might be oh, sorry. considered fascist, uh, which is fair enough. They can't act in particular, they can't act authentically, if you see what I mean. Um, they can't grow beards. Uh, they have to speak German when they're... So there's all these kind of very strange rules about being authentic. Um, but the authenticity is clearly not there. So yet they're playing this very strange game <laughs> where they have to kind of somehow be real, but they can't be real because they're not going to, you know, read Mein Kampf and uh, abuse Jews. It's not going to happen. And if it does happen, they get thrown out because they, they've turned into something else. <laughs> and that in itself is very... Prom I mean, what are they turned into? I mean, how realistic are they? Sorry, so to go back to the question about what, what is brought into the past, the past is sanitised by reenactment, but it is sanitised by any um, historical uh, versioning of the past, historical narrativ narrativization of the past, because we can't go as far as the past was. Um, in some ways, it would be more authentic to do an experiment, because you can replicate it. You can do you know, um, an air, you can make an air pump, you can do uh, most experiments, you can split an atom even if you want to. You can't execute someone. <laughs> so why we're so bothered about this game of violence, I don't quite understand really. And maybe there's something about a wish to see a violent things but not being, but those things not being violent. A wish to see history as something which isn't just a litany of wars and murders and executions, but which is something which is just a kind of progress, a procession of performance of stuff which we can comprehend and therefore understand. It's not scary anymore if people don't die. I've seen any of these, but there's there's some quite good examples of these where what they've done is they've done they've taken a group of people and put them into historical situations. Uh, and there is one called the trench, which was they built a trench in um uh, Kent and they put these guys in this trench. Um, and it was very impressive and it was it was very very informative for what it must have been like to live in a trench and they lived in the mud and it was horrible and cold and they had people bomb them but they weren't going to be killed <laughs> so there's still this kind of frontier. frontier and not not that i'm saying we should be you know killing people during our, our reenactment but but it's still a performance it's still always some kind of controlled thing 
And so therefore, as a way of engaging with the past, it gets us over certain barriers uh, in terms of authenticity, in terms of a, a direct engagement, in terms of the kind of affective response that we might have, like the children crying. But it doesn't get us to the past. The past is always something which is there and violent and horrible that we're trying to control in this way. And in some ways, you might argue that reenactment is a... Uh, more of a, it looks like it's doing more than it is. It looks like it's being realer than it actually is. Actually, all it is is much, it's very much controlling the past, but it's doing it in a kind of way which is, um, which seems to suggest it's more radical than it might be. Does that make sense? I I, I remember uh, there's a there's a, um, a boy in, the, in our enactment who is a, he's a safe keeper, mm -hmm. but uh, there's a, a narrative. Of this reenactment of, of the of the war in Spain, um, I think very different of the of the civil war, mm -hmm. which, would, which would be the closest war we have had. Mm -hmm. And all of them want, want to want to act, um, attain that realism, mm -hmm. but they are looking to movies. They are not looking to books mm -hmm. because they, they they usually don't read books. Mm -hmm. They haven't. Most of them haven't had enough uh, education. Uh, and they look into movies. Mm -hmm. And one of one of the of the of the boys who was a reenactor of a Belgian a Belgian horseman went to the director or the mm -hmm. coordinator of the reenactor and and she said, "I can fall, I can fall down like the like the Indians in oh, the really? cowboy <laughs> movies." And and the boy and the friends was, "Yeah, yeah, he can, he can," and he did it. Mm. And, uh, theoretically, in in the historical moment, nobody fought. No, no, no. And, and, you, can, and you, can, you, can, you could see him just fought, still on the horse, running around the, running, the battlefield. Being, being, being taken around. So they, they are mixing, they are mm -hmm. mixing the, the different, different perspectives of history. Mm -hmm. And they, they think they can, even the cowboy movies are real, mm -hmm. are, are, are historical. Mm -hmm. and yeah. But I, and in some ways, I don't. I don't I'm not an historian, so I don't find that a problem, if you see what I mean. I do find it a problem. But equally, what I'm interested in is how our historical imaginations are created. And one of the ways they're created, one of the major ways they're created, is by film. Um, and we need to understand that. We can't just sort of say this is bad. We need to say, well, actually, yeah. And that's not now. I mean, for a hundred years, people have been thinking that the 19th century in, in um the west of America was cowboys and Indians, and this is what they look like. <laughs> and it's not really the case, but it's still this kind of why we're bothered about these ideas of sort of um, frontier kind of activity. And there's all kinds of really interesting things coming out of that. Why are they? It's a border fight, you know. There's um, there's a kind of sense of uh, martyrdom is there going on there? You know, there's all kind, uh, but also most of the, uh, you know, a kind of if he's Belgian. He's fighting like a Native American. You know, what's the kind of identity going on? <laughs> There's lots of very interesting. The same way that the, the the people who pay the French soldiers, mm -hmm. I think that the the most proud moment is to be um, fusilar, is to be killed in, in I don't know in front of, of a row of uh, I don't know, I don't remember the word in English. In front of a row of, of soldiers, mm -hmm. when you ex execute. Oh, firing squad. Firing squad. So. You can you can see they are fighting and they're fighting by they look a, a little a little bored mm -hmm. because you know they are going to lose mm -hmm. they are losing the battle once again mm -hmm. but when there's a moment where they, they are fighting squads of Englishmen so and they they Frenchmen and the Frenchmen are they are very proud yeah you know, because they are dying for for France for France mm -hmm. they are in even France mm -hmm. so in the in the in the just following your idea of martyrdom mm -hmm. when and when people die there's something. I, I, some, some, someone, that, some, some once told me, I was very tired. I have a, 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 a an arm rake mm. of firing, so I, I went, I died, I went dead, <laughs> and I fought. And and because I was tired. I, I was very tired, and and they, t and they, they try to, to find a way, of playing, mm. in, in sometimes in in, in, a, in a childish way. Mm. Oh no, so completely natural. And in some ways, that's the reality of it, isn't it? In some ways. Rather than them being very careful and this is my role and I'm going to do this properly, actually, the diversity of things and the strangeness of it makes it more real because that's how things are <laughs> than if you just regimental, you know, you do it in a very regimented way. The, but in terms of they're always losing, the genius of British and North American reenactment 
is that it is reenactment generally of civil conflict, which means that both sides win. So civil war reenactment in the UK is the 1640s, roundheads, cavaliers, broadly. So you can reenact several types of battles where both sides get to win. Um, uh, civil war reenactment in the United States, the same. You can do both. I mean, you know, there's a narrative which is slightly problematic if you're uh, on the wrong side, <laughs> but you can probably deal with that. Um, but you, you know, in terms of the actual, it, it's not always, as you say, <laughs> always losing. History is always going. <laughs> I'm never going to be able to break out of this cycle of losing. Um, so I, so I start to subvert it. So I start to undermine it. So yeah. So the genius of, of North American and English um, Anglophone reenactment is this kind of sense that anyone either side wins so it doesn't really matter <laughs> you know there's no ideological kind of investment in in either side in some way which i find odd uh, but that's because i'm no we, we, are, we are finding it for us even for for our film for our documentary is beginning to be more important than the contemporary themes than the historical ones mm -hmm. so as maria was was saying there's, there there's there's a um, appealing of a, of social structure mm -hmm. so in, in in the few days of the of this reenactment uh, women dress like, dress like men mm. men some of them dress like uh, dress like a uh, guerrilla mm -hmm. and and they and and the women have a more uh, yes protagonism mm. in those days they, some of them have begun to to acquire the, the, their own their own arm. their own stuff. So they get agency, right? So this is so this is back to what I was saying about the transformative possibility of it. Yeah, that you kind of you are you step outside of the norm, and so that and that allows you to challenge and to think differently about your identity in the now and the then, and that so that that's amazing, and that. That's something that, to my mind, no other historical en engagement allows. It does, you might say that film does that a little bit, allows you to think imaginatively about different states of being, books maybe because of your reading. But actually dressing up, you're doing something slightly different and you're stepping outside into a different role. And that, and that um, puts into tension, at least, all of the roles that you're or generally living, or that you might think of it, uh, living in. And that's amazing. Um, we, we asked some reenactors, well, some, uh, mostly women, where you dress like a man, mm -hmm. uh, what would you think if a man dressed like a woman? Mm -hmm. like, like a woman? And most of, the, no, most of them didn't <laughs> like it. Obviously, this is interesting. So there's no, there's no men dressed as camp followers, or as cooks, or as nurses, or... Because there's quite a substantial female element in the, in the, um, the uh, war. There's quite a lot of big sort of um, set of women uh, being part of that war. There's no reason why men shouldn't. I mean, you're right. It's, it's only one way. Isn't it? <laughs> There's not the other way, right? So, um, whereas in theatre, it the person inside doesn't matter, does it? The person inside, whatever they are playing, doesn't necessarily matter. Whereas here, it does, and that's because there's maybe something which is working slightly differently, or someone is somehow working. There's a great book by. Um, a woman called Rebecca, I can't remember her surname, on camera, uh, called Performing Remains, uh, which is Rebecca Schneider, called Performing Remains, which is about this very issue. She's someone who's she's interested in art reenactment, but she also works on reenactors generally, and she's really interested in how reenactment can allow new identities to form. So um, there's a there's a theatre group in New York whose name escapes me. Who do a lot of reworkings of theatrical performance, um, and she does a lot of work on them. So she might be interesting to look at just for that kind of element of it.